Good afternoon, everybody. Uneducated economist here. Have you noticed everything in the economy is always counterintuitive to what you thought? You know, that's one of the things that I really had to come to the understanding of when I was doing the research into the economy is that sometimes when I would look at something and I would think, man, that's going to totally be, you know, this particular way. And then I would have to step back and say, okay, now what would be the reasonings that it wouldn't take place? See, like, have you ever watched that show? Uh, it was the the ghost hunters. I've, I've referred to them before, Taps. Um, these guys would chase off paranormal, like, experiences that people had. And they would go and, like, do the research. They would set up the cameras. They would spend the night. They would do all this, like, footage and and gather all this evidence and then they would like you know go through all the evidence and like watch all the footage and try and figure out what it is that was like catch catch these ghosts on camera you know and see what it is that's happening at these haunted locations you know and what i liked best about their show is that they would take all this evidence and then try to disprove what it is that they found so if they found like you know a curtain moved or whatever, they would go and try and figure out why it is that the curtain moved. Like, what was it that was causing this to happen? Why does this door slam shut? What is this creaking sound that's happening? And if they could duplicate the sound or find it out there, then they could answer the questions of what, the, what it is that these people were experiencing as far as what they thought was paranormal. And that's really what I thought was like pretty, pretty much the same thing that I think I do when it comes to trying to understand the economy. Like people said this, for example, when you have the interest rates rise, you are going to see the housing market crash because people won't afford the higher interest rates. And even today, I'm still finding articles talking about how the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, which is causing the mortgage rates to continue to rise. And I'm thinking to myself, no, they're not. The interest rates on the mortgages did not work at the same as the Federal Reserve lifting of interest rates at the Fed funds level. There was two different things happening there. Now, yes, mortgage rates shot up when the Federal Reserve went to raise interest rates. That is very true. But then they plateaued out and they've been consistently around that six to seven percent for months, months and months, even though the Federal Reserve continues to lift the in raise the interest rates. So this is very counterintuitive to what a lot of people were saying. The Federal Reserve continues to raise rates. You would see the mortgage rates go up and people wouldn't be able to afford it. That's not what happened, right? What ended up happening is the mortgage market started to find its support because there is a demand for mortgages out there that are not from the people who are actually looking to buy a house, but from the investors who are looking to buy the mortgage that you had signed. See, that's really where the difference is. That's where my question started to come in. It's like, how big is that demand? People didn't ask that. Because if you have less mortgages being taken out because people can't afford the higher interest rates, then what ends up happening is less mortgages are being written. And if less mortgages are being written and less mortgages are being refinanced, then that's less mortgages being produced into mortgage-backed securities. And if you have less mortgage-backed securities out there in the market, then you have less mortgages for the investor to go out there and buy. The supply and demand imbalances, eventually the mortgage-backed mortgage, is, mortgage -backed security gets to a price level that the investor says, hey, that's it, that's where I'm in. And it seems to be right around the level that it is today because it's been that way for months now, even though the Fed continues to raise rates. See, the impression that people have is much different. I mean, it, intuitively, that totally like, you know, you say the Fed is going to raise rates. That's going to put pressure on the rest of the mortgages out there and you're going to or up at the rest of the interest rates out there, including mortgages. And you're going to see the interest rates continue to rise. That I mean, all that stuff textbook is exactly the way it would go down. But that's not what happens in reality. Not, not this time around. Now, it could happen, and, you know, it may be different the next time it goes around, but this time around, that's the way it happened. You know, I think about like even even the BRICS nations, think about all the stuff that we've been hearing about the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Right? These nations are doing trade outside of the dollar. This is very dangerous for the dollar and its world reserve currency status. Now, this is something that people have asked me about time and time again, and I have been very little, I have very little concern about this taking over as the world reserve currency. Yes, it is happening. 
Yes, they are doing it. There is very little doubt in my mind that they will continue to try and do this. My only question that I had for people out there is what is it that other nations going to want when it comes down to doing trade with these nations who have then done sovereign currency trades in their own sovereign currency, right? Not the dollar. What are they going to ask for? People said they're going to ask for their own currency. Well, they're not. No, they're not. Because no other nation out there wants anything other than dollars. Because that's what everybody is using. Even Russia wants dollars at the end of the day. Take a look at the article that I leave, or I'll leave a few articles down there for you. Look at, look at the articles down there and think about what we have been hearing for the last, you know, year. That Russia and India are doing this trade in oil and all this oil, all this cheap oil is going over to India. And India is paying for it in rupees and, and Russia is happy to take the, the rupees, right? They're all excited to do this because they're doing trade outside of the dollar. And people are like, look right there, this is the evidence of it. Nah, you know, this is, this is the dollar losing its status, right? And then you go and you take a look and you see Russia is like at the end of the day going, man, what we really need is some dollars. We don't need rupees. Right? They don't want you want. I mean, they may want it. They may want to do it. They might want to try and do as much deals as they can with the BRICS nations. But at the end of the day, the rest of the world wants dollars. That's what that's what's happening. Take a look at the take a look at those articles that I leave down there. I mean, you know, when I see people like get so like committed to a belief that. Things like the dollar is going to fail. The Federal Reserve lost control. Inflation is going to go hyperinflation. You know, all this stuff, like it, it gets rammed down our heads, like, you know, down our throats, in our heads constantly. And very few people like take into consideration just to step back and say, okay, I'm going to think about this in a real logical sense. Like, what would I do if I was Russia and all of a sudden I had a bunch of rupees and now I go around and I'm like, man, I have been fighting war. I need resources. I need all kinds of stuff. And I have a bunch of rupees in India. You're not quite cutting it for what I need. Hey, you want rupees over there? No, no. Anybody? Nobody wants rupees, huh? I'm going to have to sell these things off for dollars because everybody wants dollars. Yeah. You, every, all you, everybody wants dollars. Yeah, that's what I thought. You know, think a look at this. Think about it like this. Okay. China. Manufacturing is leaving China because manufacturing in China is now expensive and this whole like disruption of the supply chain screwed them all up. And now they're going to start globalizing, doing this like re-globalization of the manufacturing. And China's moving a lot of their companies to places like Vietnam and Mexico and wherever, right? Malaysia, like there's all these places that they're going with this stuff. Now I think about this for just a minute. You take a bunch of factories and you put them down in Mexico, right? These are Chinese companies moving their fa their manufacturing base over to China because it's cheaper. And where, why? Because it's closer to the United States. So they can get what? Dollars. Do you think the China, you think the United States is going to be buying all this Mexican manufactured Chinese, Chinese Mexican manufactured goods with, you know, rupees uh, or yuan or rubles? No, they're going to be using dollars. And that's what the world is going to continue to use. And that's why, like, if you if you really want to know like how it's going to go down cuz like if if it was going to go down the way that people are saying it then we wouldn't find articles like we're finding now where Russia is just like I, I can't deal with this I need dollars right we're finding those articles starting to come out because they've been doing this for too long and it's too much for them right they need to actually make purchases using dollars because that's what people want so if you think about it for for a little bit how will the dollar really fail cuz if this isn't the way then how will it go down? Because the way it's really going to end up going down is when you have a final failure of confidence within the dollar itself. And now people are not losing confidence in the dollar. People are like, oh, well, they're going to run to gold. Well, they are kind of running to gold. Like you can see the gold and the dollar are going to strengthen together. Pull up a dollar index, right? The U.S. dollar index. And take a look at what it's been doing for like the last 10 years, 10, 10 to 15 years. Right? And you're going to see that it bottomed out like in 2006 or seven or something like that. It was down at like 70 or something like that. I can't even remember how low the dollar index was. 
It's now up over 100. It's 101. Now, yes, it was 112 just months ago or a year ago or whatever it was. And it's down now at 100. But take a look at the, the peaks. Take a look at the highs and lows over the last 10 years. And then take a look at the peaks from the from like the early 80s. Right? And you're going to see, if you draw a line through the peaks from the early 80s, we have broken out a trend. And if you draw new lines from both on the uh, drawing a line connecting the peaks, and then you draw a line connecting the bottoms, from the last 10 years, you're going to find that we're setting a new channel going up. Right? So it's starting a new upward trend. We are going to find times of dollar weakness. Yes, we might even find months, even years of it. But the dollar is going to go stronger before it fails. And that's really where a lot of people are just like so hard to wrap their head around. I had a guy, you know, approach me the other day. Well, he didn't really approach me. He just happened to be talking about it. And he was going off about the dollar losing its, you know, losing its its purchasing power. Right? It was like going off. It's lost 90% of its purchasing power. You could hardly buy it. And I was just like... I asked him, I said, if that's the case, I said, from all the money printing, how come quantitative easing one, two, three, and four failed to produce the inflation scenario that the Federal Reserve was looking for? When I said that to him, he did the whole pfft and rolled his eyes. And I was like, okay, well, I'm out of it. Like, I don't even really want to hear what you have a response for if that's kind of the response you have for me. But that's really a problem. Right. Because people who don't understand quantitative easing and what happened during, one, you know, the you know, the first one, two, three, and four quantitative easing back in 2008. When did they start? 2008 or so and finished around 2012, if I remember right. I can't remember the exact dates of how, how long they ran it for. But quantitative easing went for quite some time. And that really did not produce any inflation that the Federal Reserve was truly looking for. It did produce some. And it got a little bit of like the inflation expectation to cause some inflation, but for the most part, they actually experienced more deflation during during that time than they did actual inflation, um, or a disinflation, I guess I should say, because it didn't produce the inflation scenario that they were truly looking for, and that was a lot of money printing. Now, this time around was much different with the supply chain breakdown and a stimulus package going out at the exact same time. Of course, you know, people will fail to like, you know, think about the supply chain side of things and they will only focus in on the on the Federal Reserve and the money printer side of things. And that's what this guy had the problem with. And he wouldn't, you know, didn't even want to engage in any kind of conversation. So I just, you know, I didn't even I didn't even attempt it. I just let him, you know, do his, you know, do his speak. But, you know, really, that's that's what I find a lot of stuff out there is that is that when we look at a lot of these things that are happening within the economy, especially when it comes to the obvious stuff that we find out there in the news, it's very difficult sometimes to wrap our head around why it is that it doesn't exactly play out the way that everybody said it was. I had a guy come to me and say, man, I didn't buy a house the other day because of this particular YouTuber out there and his information. And he was saying, man, house prices are going to crash because interest rates are going to continue to go up. And I was just like, uh, okay. And I gave him my spiel about what I feel about mortgages and the investors and going into them and how those interest rates are probably going to plateau out. And if the Federal Reserve is done peaking or if they are done with the raising of interest rates at this point, then you're probably not going to see mortgage rates go up any further from here. In fact, there's an article I'll leave down in the description that says if the Federal Reserve keeps interest rates elevated, that that's going to be good for the mortgage market. And I can't remember exactly how he said it. I think it was because if you have, I think it was a lot of, a line, a lot of the, a lot along the lines of what I was saying with the mortgages and how there's going to be less mortgages being written out there. And that demand for mortgage backed securities will then pr create like basically a floor to keep the mortgages from falling any further. And the interest rates would then be supported with the with the investors, you know, basically looking at looking for those mortgages out there to buy the mortgage backed securities, essentially. So these things are happening out there. They happen like, you know, in the background, you got to you got to think what's really taking place, like, you know, step back and think, OK, is there a reason why this wouldn't happen? You know, 
I mean, think about the unemployment. People were expecting unemployment to be running rampant right now, but it's not. Unemployment is like, you know, and of course, uh, the un the official numbers, I know, because people will roll their eyes and say, well, the official numbers, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I get that. Now, they can fake it all they want, right? But it's not the point. The numbers are there for their monetary policy. And if we are to try and understand their monetary policy and what their strategies are going to be, we use their numbers. Like, we can make the decisions for ourselves all we want, right? And that's what I do. And that's what I'm thinking I'm doing when I go counter to what a lot of people are saying out there saying, you know, well, you're completely wrong. Interest rates are going to go up. Housing market's going to crash. You know, boo-hoo on you. And I'm thinking, okay, well, what would cause the housing market to crash? Let's think about that for a little bit. Let's find the reasonings that there would be an actual housing market crash, right? Because interest rates have gone up, but it hasn't done it yet. So that didn't do it, right? But what is going to do it is if people stop making their payments, and if they stop making their payments, why would they stop doing that? So if they're stopped making their payments, they're generally going to stop doing it because they have lost their job. And now if they have lost their job, it's because they couldn't find another one, right? And if you can't find another one, that means that there is no jobs out there that are available. That doesn't seem to be the case right now. Unemployment is still low. So once we see unemployment rise, now we got an opportunity for people to not make their payments. And then we could see foreclosures start to kick in from the failure of not making payments. But just because the interest rates went up does not mean that the housing market is going to crash. Like everybody seemed to think it did. Like I didn't say that. Like I was not part of that game. I mean, I said that if the interest rates go up, it's going to be very difficult for people to buy a house. And the prices are probably going to start coming down. And we are seeing that. But we're not seeing it in a significant way because the support for the mortgage market is starting to find itself from the investors. That's the problem that people did not take into consideration. I talked to a lot of people about that when I brought it up to even a lot of famous, you know, YouTubers. You know, I brought up that exact thing and, you know, many of them didn't have an answer for me because they hadn't really, you know, considered that, you know, as far as, you know, part of the scenario that would take place out there. Everybody just thinks crash. And that's another, like, so what are we going to have? Are we going to have the dollar strengthen? Or are we going to, like, n avoid a recession? Right? Because people are like, no, dude, you're totally wrong. Everything's going to crash and the dollar's going to crash right along with it. And it doesn't make sense to me, right? Because if everything crashes, that means it loses all the value out of it. It means the house went to $100,000. It means your stock portfolio went from a million dollars to $50,000, right? This is crashing, right? Everything's crashing. That means during that time, you could take less of your dollars and purchase more stuff, right? That's the dollar strengthening during recessions. Everything goes on sale. You know, that's what drives me nuts about when I hear like, two-faced comments that come out of a lot of you a lot of like people who claim to be economists saying that the dollar is worthless get out of the dollar the horrible crash is coming everybody's going to lose everything they own there's going to be a huge stock market you know wipeout. and i'm thinking well which one is it right i mean is the stock market going to go down and crash or is the dollar going to fail and that would mean that the stock market goes to the moon I mean, wh which one is it that you think is going to happen? I mean, you can't have it both. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You can't have both. You can have gold and the dollar rise together when you have the dollar as a safe haven asset and gold as the ultimate security away from everything that's a third party risk. Yeah, I can see where those two could rise together and they are and they're going to continue to do it time okay i'm 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 done it's almost 20 minutes into this all right uneducated economist you let me know 